because these tournaments fundamentally are an opportunity for young people to cultivate their voice. It's an opportunity for them to build some skill sets that folks all across the world uh, have challenges with. There are two things that say people say is they fear. That's public speaking and death. Now that, that death thing, unless you got some connection with God, I don't know about, that's going to be a hard one for you to rectify. But that first one, we can all work on uh, making sure that we become better public speakers. And the students that we have here are doing something that a lot of adults don't put themselves in a position to do. And that is to cultivate their public speaking skills, cultivate their critical thinking skills, and more importantly for, for some students to work on deficiencies that they may have in front of complete strangers. Uh, we have students that have challenges with reading, we have some students that have challenges with their social, social skills, with being bashful and shy, we have some students that their brain don't work as fast as their mouth does, and, uh, and in every situation, in every circumstance, uh, these students are putting their deficiencies or their challenges that they have out there on front street. And for us, primarily, what I want to emphasize to you that you may be new to debate, but you're not new to thinking. And if you are new to thinking, just keep that to yourself. <laughs> okay? I just want to assume that at this point in your life, at this stage, that you can at least master that a little bit. Uh, and if that's not the case, like I said, we just hold that to ourselves. But I also want to say, too, that if I don't say anything else this morning that you hold on to, that you hang your hat on, just remember you are a cheerleader today. Okay? Now, I know you didn't bring your pom-poms and all that good stuff, but you brought your heart, you brought your, your words of encouragement, you brought your smiling face. And at the end of the day, even if you may not know every single thing about debate, you can be an affirming adult for these young people. And that's, at the end, that's, that is what this is about. This is about creating a community where young people feel comfortable in doing something that most adults have a problem doing and helping them get the skill sets that's going to allow them to be tremendous and awesome for the 21st century, regardless of your political affiliation. And obviously, the need for us to have some critical thinkers at a critical time right now is important because we need young people that have the, the advocacy skills, the critical thinking skills, uh, the critical reading and oral communication skills uh, for the next generation, even for right now, for that, so, so to speak. So I want people uh, to understand what this is all about. This is about us being cheerleaders today. So be happy when you walk in the room. Don't, don't, don't look like somebody beat you up with the ugly stick, okay? Don't, don't, don't be frowning like somebody just, you know, like it was the worst thing, like you ate a, a bowl of lemons, okay? Just be enthusiastic, okay? Come on, work, work with me here. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, see, you're supposed to be smiling now. See, we can practice. One, two, three, see, smile. See, see what it does to you. It's just contagious. It makes you feel better. See, you know, you turn to look at somebody and they smiling. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. You look at, you look at somebody and they frowning. Okay, not so much. So what we want to do is make sure that when students walk, the moment they walk in the room, they feel like, wow, this person here is, is at least is going to be, it's going to be all right. Okay. So what we want to do today also <coughs> is go over some information, some rules. After I've kind of given you my little spiel about what your purpose is, uh, we want to also just make sure that you uh, have some some information that can help guide the process as you're judging these debates. All of you are more than qualified to judge debates. All of you, all of you are more than qualified to be able to uh, assess these students, some basic things that's going on in terms of public speaking, in terms of the way they formulate argument, because all of you every day are living a world of debate. All of us, every day. Every, from the things we wear, to the buildings we go in, to the TV shows we watch, to the food that we eat, it's all one big debate. The world is one big debate. People are always trying to make arguments for you to buy something, sell something, get rid of something to go somewhere, people are always making arguments. And I'll even say we as human beings are one big argument. My definition of a human being is that we're the sum total of all the arguments that we've either accepted or rejected up to this point in our life. So we're constantly evolving. You know, we're constantly changing based upon the information that we take in and the information that, you know, we put out in terms of how we want to live our life. So we're really engaged in a process to really help the young people go through the same kind of transformation to help them be uh, equipped be successful in the 21st century, okay? And uh, I think education is at the, at, the, at the base in terms of being able to be that gateway for them to have the kind of success we all, I think, want all our students to, to be engaged in. Uh, in terms of the, the packet that you'll have, if you turn with me to, to page three, it kind of gives you a step-by-step -step process of what happens at the debate tournament. 
many of you have already kind of gone through a couple part of the process. You've signed in. Your teams have gotten registered. When you walk through the doors, you saw the registration room, uh, registration table, and that table there uh, allows you to get your teams registered. If you're a coach, even if you're a parent that's supporting, what you want to do is in the morning is one of the first things you want to know that you get. So don't just go to the cafeteria. Make sure that you check in at the registration table at this tournament and future tournaments and make sure that uh, people know that your school is represented. And if the coach hasn't got here yet, we want to just let us know what the deal is, kind of update us. We prefer that there be one contact person, main person from each school that's responsible for making sure all the students arrive, <coughs> that the teams are set up the way they're supposed to, and that you all have all the judges that you had told us about before, before the tournament. So that's the very first thing. Uh, then afterwards, then you have an opportunity to sit and interact with the kids until something calls out we call the parents. Uh, and that's something that's amazing. You're going to see students get excited over a piece of paper. I mean, it's just a miraculous. I mean, I'm serious. It's one of the most amazing things I have ever seen. You know, you just stick a piece of paper on the wall with some tape, and you'd be amazed what happens to young people. Like, they get excited. And, and, and yeah, I mean, for, for a generation of young people that are caught up on technology and video games, a piece of paper. It's like old school. It's like giving like a ball and, you know, thread. And it's like, huh, here you go, have some fun. That's what I used to do. Like, my parents give me a paper clip and they'd be like, make this happen. <laughs> Get creative, okay? So this is the same type of thing that you have here with the debate tournaments in terms of the enthusiasm. Knowing those parents, though, what's so important about it is that what you see on the parents is there'll be, uh, there'll be a space at the top that'll tell you what round it is. They'll tell you if it's round one, round two, round three, round four. Because at the debate tournaments, we're going to have four debates today. Four debates. Students are going to be affirmative two debates, and they're going to be negative for two debates. Okay? They're going to be affirmative for two debates, and then they're going to be negative for two debates. Okay? Here you go. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about this, and then I'll come back to a little bit about, let's turn the page, uh, turn the page uh, four. Real quick, uh, we're not going to spend much time. These are just to let you know that there are different divisions. And at the tournament, we have four divisions here. We have a novice, junior varsity, varsity, and a high school division. Uh, and so we have students participating in all those different divisions depending on their experience level. One of the big things you need to know about debate is that debate is cool because it doesn't put a, a ceiling on students. Okay, It doesn't put a ceiling on students. Students can be... Can, can find themselves debating in varsity, and they could be in the sixth grade, okay? We have some students here that have been debating since third, fourth grade, because they just, they just, I don't know, they have, you know, some, <laughs> no, I'm just, no, just, just, we appreciate that. We just got some kids that are like that, that want to be, and, and we should have those spaces in our society where if young people are really enthusiastic, really go get us, really want to try to advance themselves intellectually, that they should, they shouldn't have to wait just because. And so we have young people here that will have maybe have debated and had success in the novice and JV division. That you'll be, if you're looking or going past the room and then in the bar, you're like, how is this, this, this seventh grader debating against this eighth grader? Because debate is all about your experience level and your success, not about your grade level. So I don't want you to look, and if you're debate, judging the rhyme, he's like, this doesn't make sense. This team is way older than this other team. That's just where they are in their experience level. And that's reflected in our divisions that we have. So uh, most of you will start judging in the novice, some of you in the JV division, appearance on your, uh, your experience. And as you do judge more and you feel more and more comfortable with the process, we would love for you to get to a place where you feel comfortable judging the varsity division as well. Uh, from time to time, we ask people to judge their high school division as well. Uh, those students are just kind of starting out. Our, now, our high school division is intended to kind of be a gateway uh, for students that are just kind of starting out in, in, in high school debate and give them a chance to, uh, to get their feet wet, okay? And with the hopes that they will go to even more at-large tournaments that exist in the Metro Atlanta area. But I want to make sure that we all understand that we want everybody judging. That's my big theme here. We need everybody judging so that we can have the rounds. And you have something important to say. Next time you tell me you don't have, you're not special, look at your fingerprints. Look at your hand and rub your hand. Because guess what? You're the only person in the world that got those fingerprints. So don't tell me you're not special, okay? And because you're special, you have something special to these young people. And we all have something unique. One of the things we try to tell the kids is they need to learn to adapt to their judge, okay? So just because you don't feel you as experienced as this judge 
doesn't mean that you don't have something else you need to say and implant and plant a seed in those young people that can help them be the type of folks. Because when they get older, they're not going to get to pick and choose who their boss is. They're not going to get to pick and choose who they give a presentation to. They're not going to get to pick and choose what bank they go ask for a loan from. They're not going to get to pick and choose. So the ability to, to adapt and explain things to a variety of different people can only benefit them down the road. Okay? So we want them to have a variety of different folks with a variety of different skill sets, lived experiences, being able to uh, watch them do things. Okay? With page five. <clears throat> page five, you see the debate set up. It is, uh, it's, it, it, doesn't hold, it doesn't have to hold true to this form, but that just gives you kind of a loose idea. Uh, you're going to have four students in the room. Two students are going to be debating affirmative. Two students are going to be debating negative. And those students are going to, sometimes they'll debate in front of a podium. Sometimes they'll turn over a trash can and speak on top of it. But they'll usually speak from some centralized place. And you'll be in a be position so that you can see them. Hopefully they never have their back to you. Uh, hopefully you can make good eye contact uh, with them throughout the debate so they can read your nonverbals uh, and adapt accordingly. But you usually, in most of the debates, it's just you and four other students. So you're the educator. That's why when I said you're the cheerleader, you're the person <coughs> that kind of sets the tone for that, for that space. Think about it as if, uh, think about it like this. Have you ever had a bad teacher? Y'all ain't none of y'all had a bad Y'all y'all work with me. Y'all looking at me like, yeah, so, I mean, come on now. Y'all got to give me a little something this morning. It's no, it's early. I, but, but none of y'all never had a bad teacher. Y'all been yeah. wonderful. It's amazing. I'm trying to right. talk to y'all right. right. school. Woo, y'all, nobody had a bad. I know we got teachers in the room, but y'all don't all the time. Okay, so I don't want y'all to tell on y'all selves. Exactly. I know y'all not going to fall into that category. But I'm saying that y'all have, because I know the good ones are the ones that motivated y'all to teach. But the bad ones made you think, like, I don't know if I want to do this. Yeah. Okay. So the bad teachers, what I want you to draw on. I know you got negative flashbacks, you're having some issues right now. But I need you to draw on them and think about how horrible was the educational experience when you had to go to their class. Uh huh. See, that's, see, I heard that. See, I, 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 I could see, I could see that too. It was, uh -huh. it was, it was rough, wasn't it? Well, think about that. Everything that teacher was made it hard, made it, made it difficult to want to learn in that environment. We want it to be just the opposite when you go to work with students in that debate round. Part of it is smiling. Remember we talked about that? Smiling, okay. Smiling is important. Part of it is be affirming. Okay? If your nonverbals are positive, then usually that's contagious. And then when that works only in the debate round, it works in life. Try it at work. See what happens to you if you go smiling every day for a week at work. You may change your colleagues. They may actually say hello to you. Okay? So so the point I'm trying to get at is that you set the tone, and because the debates are not going to be something like out of the great debaters, I know some people have this notion that it's going to be a big auditorium and the kids. Gonna, we don't, unfortunately, we don't, we can't replicate that and give an experience to all the students. Uh, so we have multiple debates going on at the same time. So we'll be using, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 classrooms all at one time at a particular school, and you'll have those four students in that room and someone like yourself judging the debates. So. That's important that you're kind of the gatekeeper and setting the tone. And be the adult that you can be. We know all of you are awesome. All of you are amazing. And if you're not, just like just like that other just like thinking. Don't tell nobody. Just just, just fake it till you get it, okay? Okay. And uh, we want you to know that. The things here, uh, the uh, one of the things I want you to make sure there's a there's a mistake right here and a little typo, but the preparation time, each time is each team is gonna get five minutes instead of ten minutes, okay? We, that's a change that we have this year. Uh, they're giving five minutes, not ten minutes, as for each side, not for the total debate. So the total debate is ten minutes, but each team is only getting five minutes of preparation time. Okay, that's all levels. All levels, all levels, even high school. Okay, in the past there was there was more preparation time, but we found a couple things were happening. Students weren't taking advantage of it. Uh, the students that did take advantage of it wasn't seeing really. Uh, increase in the quality of their debating. So what we want to try to focus on is the increasing their critical thinking ability and the ability to think faster under pressure with a short amount of time will spur them to make more use and more efficient use of their time. Well, it's like a countdown clock. They have five minutes for their side for those two students to use throughout the entire debate. So if one student uses two minutes for the first speech, then they only have three minutes left for the entire debate. Okay? So it's for the entire debate that side. 
Now, obviously, when the other side is using their prep time, they could, you know, be working as well, which is what smart teams do. <laughs> you know, so you should. You know, it's just like if the, if the teacher gives everyone a break, you know, you should take advantage of that break too. Or they, you know, if the other team is taking some time, then you're more than welcome to do it. So you don't have to be like, no, that's that team's prep time, so you can't work. So uh, if anybody's taking prep time, all four students are available or are able to use that. Okay. Uh, we can talk about how you determine, determine winning teams here in a second on some of these other parts of the handout. I want you to go to uh, page six, okay? Okay, page six just tells you your role again as a judge. Uh, we've talked about this over and over. The point that I want to emphasize to you uh, that's on this sheet is the part that's in bold at the bottom. Please do not disclose your decision, okay? Please do not disclose, put a big circle around there. Don't forget that. Uh, that's up there with the smiling part. If you smile and do not disclose your decision, then we're going to be good. Okay? Because the rest of the stuff I can work with. But if you don't smile, yeah. yeah we're going to issue. I'm serious. When I see you and you ain't smiling, I don't like that. I mean, we got to be all day together. Let's smile. Okay, please? It makes the day go by so much better if you smile. And the second thing is don't disclose. Because guess what happened when you disclose? Kids come to me and they ain't smiling. And that ain't a good thing either. Okay? For some odd reason, every debater thinks they don't want every debate. Every debate. Every debate. You ought to come see the every debate team. Every time, every debate think they want every time. If especially this group, because I'll come out, there'll be a group of kids that come up to my knee, and then one, one group of kids will be like, oh, J-Roll, we won that debate round. Oh, we won. I'm like, you won? You sure? Yeah, we asked them a question they ain't know the answer to it. Yeah, we won. Five minutes later, the other team come up, they come up to my waist. Okay? And they come in and they're like, oh, j -Roll, we won the debate. We won the debate. I said, you sure you won the debate? Yeah. They asked us a question. We didn't ask you because we know it was a bad question. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? I was like, clearly somebody did not win that debate round. But in the eyes of both of those, those debaters, they thought they won. And that's great because guess what? They go to the next debate happy, enthusiastic, thinking that they walking on cloud nine, that they God gift to debate, and that's great. And we want to keep that energy and enthusiasm. Now, true enough, at the end of the day, they get a harsh reality check, and they figure out that they won or lost those debates because we're going to give them the packets. And in those packets, we're going to have the ballots that you, that, that you, that, from the debates that you judge with those comments, and we're going to have an award ceremony. And we're going to give out some medals, and we're going to give out some awards, and not everybody's going to get one. And so that's going to be a learning lesson, too. Just because you don't win a medal doesn't mean you're not a winner. You know, you have to get that little spiel and be, be the adults that you are. And, uh, and the, point, the point I'm trying to get at is that when we just don't disclose, it not only does it keep the tournament going before we can all get a lot done in this one day, but it keeps the energy, a positive energy level throughout the day with the kids. So please don't disclose. And that's probably one of the hardest challenges you'll have as a judge is trying to explain the decision without telling who won. Uh, and that's probably one of the things. But I will say to you, use this rule. You know, use a two-one rule, which is for every one, you know, constructive criticism that you may give, find two positive things to say to the students. Uh, and really, to be honest with you, they're not going to grasp no more than about two or three things, and then their attention span will be like, okay. Uh, so you're going to have to make it fairly efficient and short, and give them a couple of things to kind of hang their hat on, and then let them go to the next debate. But you want the, the post-round conversation to be very. Uh, distinct, very succinct, and very short, but also you want to make sure that you're giving some affirming, positive com comments to the student. And it could be a variety of different things. It could be like, I really like the way you explain this argument. I think all you need to do is do this, this, and this. Or I really like your, your verbal communication, your tone. You were really, your eye contact was awesome in this debate. Uh, little things like that so they can uh, be encouraged to go on and do something better uh, in the next debate round. Okay? Uh, that being said, page seven. Talks about speaker points and ranks, but actually, you know, before we go there, let's go to uh, page 12 and 13. I'm gonna come back to those pages. Okay. Page 12 and 13 gives you the outline of the debate. I would encourage you to use this. A lot of judges over the past have used this kind of like as a checklist, and they just check this off as as it goes through the debate. Because I know some of you are like, well, who's supposed to speak first, and why are they speaking? Who's doing what? And uh, the reality is that this gives you kind of a step-by-step -step of what people are supposed to do. And the, the first speech in the debate is what we call the 1AC. The 1AC, that stands for, so that y'all know what these acronyms are, it stands for the first affirmative constructive speech. The first affirmative constructive speech. There are two types of speeches in the debate round. There's a constructive speech and there's a rebuttal, okay? 
and everybody gets to give a constructive and a rebuttal. Okay, that seems fair, am I right? So we got, so we got. Let's think about this for a second. We got two students on the affirmative, two students on the negative. How many students total? Four. Four. And if each student gives a constructive and a rebuttal speech, they both give how many speeches? Two. Two. So if we give each person gives two speeches and we got four debaters, how many speeches are all together? Man, that's what we call arithmetic. <laughs> I'm being funny, guys. Okay. <laughs> okay, I was trying my little. Okay, okay. Oh, no. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So you got eight speeches in the debate. Okay. Eight speeches in the debate round. And in the debate round, those eight speeches uh, are broken up into two types constructives and rebuttal. So when you see one in C, that stands for first negative constructive, two AC, second affirmative constructive, and so on and so forth. Now, the thing about it, you remember, when you're constructing something, what are you doing? Building. You're building. So in those first four speeches, you're going to see the students building up their arguments, building up their arguments. And the rebuttals, because they have a fewer, uh, less, less amount of time, then in those speeches, they're going to be focusing on synthesizing and summarizing the arguments. Okay? So you should see some difference in what they're doing just based upon the purpose of those speeches. Now, obviously, when they're novice and they're just starting out, they're just trying to get through speaking. Okay, but as you get through some of the upper level debates, then hopefully you'll see some of the technique and the strategy start to develop and evolve as they get more and more comfortable with the process. But each one of these here basically gives, tells you who's supposed to do cross-examination, which after every speech in the, in the constructives, you see that there's a chance for what we call CX. CX stands for cross-examination, cross-examination. Cross-examination is when the other team gets a chance to ask you questions about what you read and the arguments that you made. So you're kind of put in the spotlight, in the hot seat, so to speak. And so that's when you'll start. I think a lot of people like that part of the debate the most because it's really where students get to shine and their personality kind of comes out in terms of do you really know what you just got finished reading? And don't freak out in the 1AC that the students are just kind of reading what seems a prepared speech. Okay? Don't take that away, uh, knock against them or take away points for that because everyone is reading uh, a very similar prepared art set of arguments for the 1AC. Okay? And it's already done, it's in the evidence packet. People may uh, have their own little flavor a little bit to it, but by and large, you're going to get the same type of argument in the 1AC. Okay? And as 1AC, we'll talk about what those arguments look like, but you get a sense of what the structure is. You get a cross-examination, then the negative will get up and talk about why they think the, the, the affirmative is, is a horrible idea. Go figure that the negative is going to say that the affirmative is a horrible idea, and then the negative, then the negative will get a chance to be asked questions by the affirmative, and so forth and so on. Okay, uh, so hopefully, and it gives you the time limits to based upon what division you're in. The only real change is when you get to varsity in high school. There's a change in the time limits, but each debate, in novice and JV, the speaking times are roughly about 45 minutes for the entire debate plus the preparation time and your comments. So. Roughly within an hour, we should have every debate finish, from start to finish. Still always, always, and I'm going to say this over and over, they should always adapt to their judge. But there are judges, and some of them have been trained to listen to, to, rapid, to rapid delivery, okay? Mm -hmm. And your brain can process up to 500 words a minute, but we only speak between like 100 and 150. So that just means that those students are engaged in what we kind of like a, a game, for a better metaphor, like speed chess, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, but it's like speed debate. Okay, so they're dealing with multiple arguments real fast, but like, like you said, if you can't understand it, can't write it down, then what's the purpose of you doing it? You're not adapting to your judge. Okay. okay, so you should feel free to say, look, I would prefer you to be conversational speed, I prefer you more public speaking uh, approach so that I can really appreciate, and maybe affirm it that way, appreciate the depth and quality of your argument. Uh, on page 13, you see that those are the second type of art, uh, speeches, those are the, the rebuttal speeches. And it tells you kind of what the purpose of each one of those speeches. This is, and uh, and the thing that you want to make note of, the thing that I think would be important, is just take note of that the second negative constructive and the one first negative rebuttal. Up until that point, everyone had been alternating speaking, but that right there is when you have the same side speak twice, and we call that the negative block. So I just want to make note of that so that you kind of know that that's it. Uh, it's a little different, and the reason being, so to give you a quick reason, is the affirmative gets to speak first and last, and so over time people see that as an advantage to the affirmative, so to counteract that the negative has this big block of time that they get to speak in the middle of the debate, okay? But other than that, the speech is alternate from affirmative to negative, affirmative to negative, except for that one period of time in the, in the, in the debate, okay?
Any questions so far? Y'all been a great bunch. Y'all awesome. See that? And I'm smiling when I talk to you. Okay? Uh, real quick, on page 14, on page 14, this gives you an argument overview. It tells you, gives you an idea of the type of arguments you're going to hear today in all four of your debates. Today, we've limited the students to a certain set of arguments uh, to be able to read for all the divisions. So no matter what division you judge in, you're going to hear the same arguments. They're using the same evidence. But obviously, they're going to be different as, as, as we've had the question about because they're going to explain it different. Some students are going to understand the information more. Some students have worked with it more. Some students have prepared more. So you'll see the difference manifest themselves throughout the debate, especially as the debate goes on. Uh, when students have a force to try to defend and try to explain their arguments using the evidence in the packet. Okay? So, uh, but this gives you an idea of the type of arguments you'll be hearing. On the affirmative, you're going to hear uh, the affirmative make an av advocate that we should significantly increase transportation infrastructure investment in the United States by increasing transportation equity in planning and development, including increases in active transportation infrastructure and public transit. I know now y'all are saying, what does that mean? Okay. Uh, that basically is just an affirmative that's going to say that we want to try to change the way the process of decision making gets done in cities, places like Atlanta, places like Chicago, but also more importantly, set up more uh, public transit systems or public opportunities, doing things like uh, having bikeways and having walkways and those type of things that can address some issues that other issues that the affirmative uh, brings up. You're going to hear them talk about things maybe like obesity and health that we're a country that needs more active transportation uh, in order to fight that. I wouldn't know nothing about obesity, but uh, <laughs> I'm doing that uh, and, uh, and they deal with some other, other issues, like uh, that's in the affirmative, they're dealing with the economy. There are a whole host of issues that are surrounding transportation that I think you're going to find interesting as the students get to discuss. On a negative, the negative is going to make some arguments about that investment being bad, or that it's going to obviously spend too much money, we don't have the money to spend on that, or how that money trades off with highway highway funding and that we need to be able to you know support more highways as opposed to doing things with more with active transportation. So I think you're going to find the arguments interesting, they're diverse, there's a lot of different things for the students to say on both sides of this debate, and uh, you'll get a chance to be the evaluator of those arguments. Okay. Uh, Page uh, 15 and uh, 16, uh, based on page 15, you just see a basic outline of the, of the debate. So you can take that also and give you an idea of what you should be hearing in each speech, uh, but I think that will also help you out as well. Okay? Um, and then on page, uh, page 16, we've already talked about do not disclose and be affirming. Uh, all those things are really important. But the last big thing I want to talk about is the ballot and filling out the ballot. And there's an example of a ballot on page 17, okay? Uh, and it gives you an idea. All of you that are judging will get an opportunity to have a ballot. And on the ballot, it will look very similar to this. And what you do is to fill in their names, uh, get their first and last names. They should know if they're the first speaker or the second speaker. Usually they've already negotiated that with each other. Uh, beforehand. If not, then you can help them negotiate that. There's nothing more flip coin, I'm just, but, but help them negotiate that um, in terms of who's speaking first and second. And then once you have that deal, we'll listen to the debate. I would encourage you to take notes and fill this part in throughout the entire debate. Okay? It will make life much easier if you take notes and fill in. And basically what people have done, and folks that have already judged us in the room, you can chime in with strategies that you, that you use as well. But basically, as the, as the first speaker speaks and they finish their speech, maybe you make some comments about, you know, uh, you know, it'll look up more, have better eye contact, or oh, I really like your, your presence. I mean, you were really forceful, and that was really great. I could understand everywhere. Anything that you think may be helpful to them when they go back to their schools and they end up off in their practices, they can help their coaches help them become even better debaters. That's kind of the litmus test of the type of comments that you're putting in. Please be thoughtful. The biggest thing, and I, please hit me this, because I know all of you have good intentions. Okay? All of us have good intentions. And all of us love these children. And I love y'all because y'all love these children. But please, please be thoughtful. Okay? I know some of us prefer to have tough love. But not all of us are built that way. Not all of us receive that the right way. You can't be signed. I appreciate this big sound. Okay. I don't need you to be signed. I need you to be called. Okay. I don't need, need y'all to be signed. Okay. I, I need y'all to, 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 to internalize your assignment 
and express your power. Okay? okay, that's what I need you to do today. Because these are young people, okay? And no matter what or how bad their performance is, they got up this morning, they came here and they're speaking in front of you. I, I, I really, I, I'm serious about this. This is, we are a community. All of us at the Bay Band, we are all responsible for these young people. All of us. I don't care what school you represent, I don't care who you're judging, we are all one big debate family. And we want these all these kids to succeed. I don't care what school we're in the middle at the end of the day, I really don't. I know that may come a surprise to some of y'all. Because at the end of the day, I don't remember the awards I wanted to debate, I remember the relationships I had. And relationships don't work unless you have caring people to make those relationships work. None of us like bad relationships. And those relationships work in this context if we are thoughtful about the comments we put on the paper. You don't want to ever put nothing down on that paper that you're going to regret or something that's going to be taken the wrong way. If a kid did something they were mean, they were rude, if you don't feel comfortable putting it on the paper, then maybe find a coach and y'all have a conversation and, and listen to each other. Because y'all have to model the kind of behavior we want the students to have. Because if y'all act up and acting crazy and oh, we didn't win this and we didn't win that, guess how the students going to act? Okay? It's just a medal. I'll buy you a medal if you want one to put on and go back home with. Okay? Please. But let us model the kind of behavior we want the kids to have. And that starts also when you're judging. If you put some comment on there like, I can't believe you said this. You are the stupidest person oh, I've ever met. There have been comments like that that have been by adults. That have put that kind of stuff on a piece of paper. And then you expect us to get at and tell a tell child it. Now, believe me, I had a conversation with those folks over the years. And I really don't have a problem. I can get real. I will sit down and smile while I'm telling you. Okay? But the point I'm trying to give you is that the feedback needs to be thoughtful. I'm not telling you not to put constructive criticism on that. Sure, kids, you'd be like, look, you may want to think about talking a little less when, you know, with your partner doing such and such. There are ways to describe it. It's the difference between shut up and be quiet. Okay? And that's what I'm asking you to think about. Be thoughtful. Y'all are educators. Y'all are smart people. And I know you love kids. So think about how you can do that. And in this space, when you're making those comments, I think it's really important just to give some thought to how you want to describe and give those comments. Because this is used by the coaches. All of you will be using this, if even if especially the coaches, in their practices to help the students. They're going to get this and say, on this debate, they say this, this, and this. And believe me, some of the things you need to say, you need to say. Because their coach has been saying it. They ain't hearing it. You know, some things I couldn't hear the debate until I saw it on the ballot. Like, you know, Mr. Rowland, uh, it'd probably be good for you to let the other person answer the question in cross-examination. <laughs> you know, you can't ask the question and answer it. <laughs> okay? And, and maybe the coach has been trying to tell them that, but maybe it just doesn't ring true until they see it from somebody else. Sometimes you're not the messenger that brings the message that can be heard. Can't be a prophet in your own land sometimes. Okay, don't let me get stuck. I ain't going to raise no offering. Okay, y'all feeling me on this. Okay, now in those, now, now, now the last thing we really got to, to, to get done is how do you figure out what the points and ranks are? You know, told me about how to fill this in and be nice and be all that kind of stuff, but how do I fill that in? Okay, that goes back to the pages that I skipped. Okay, and those pages, if we start back on page seven, this is how you make that decision. Okay? In those pages on page seven, you're putting in the points and the ranks. Now, points and ranks are two different things. The ranks, let's start, is the simplest thing to kind of think about. You have four debaters in that debate, and you have to rank them from one to four. Now, you give the student that you think did the best job debating the one, and then go in descending order. Second best, two, and down the line. That does not mean that the kid that gets the four is horrible. So you're going to have to explain that to the kids when they get their back. How I get a four in every debate? Well, <laughs> in every debate. In every debate. <laughs> well, you are good. Let's start there. You're good and you're working hard at it. You just got to work a little bit hard. You know, you're going to have to finesse that. I'm going to leave that to you all to have your strategies of how you explain that. But the point I'm trying to get at is that it doesn't mean that that's the. You're going to have some debates where all four students are going to be like, you're going to be like, wow. I mean, I've seen some people come, I don't know how to say one and two, all of them are good. They all, can I get them all ones? No, you can't get them all ones. So you're going to have to do the th hard part of trying to figure out which one should and which one convinced you or explain something. You have to find some with the distinguishing factor to help you with that. But that's the, how you get the ranks. The points are done based upon this point scale. It's on a zero to a hundred point scale. 
We definitely don't want you to go anything lower than a 59 and 64. And that's for a very poor performance. And that shouldn't be the norm. Uh, I can't imagine that kids, uh, if we have students like that and you feel the need to, to give those or thinking about giving those kind of points, I would ask that you come find me first. Because that means that something dramatic happened in that debate. Uh, we haven't had those kind of issues. We haven't had stuff like fights or kids just breaking down. It just doesn't have, we, we family here. And the more you all smiling, when you walk in the room and people smiling, see that, that it cuts all that up so you don't have all them issues. But if you have some students that are having some challenges and you feel the need of that, those kind of points are justified, I would ask you to come talk to me first because that probably means we need to have a conversation, a teaching moment. Because we're all educators here, okay? And we're going to teach and help these young people overcome some of these issues. But the rest of those points there, you use at your discretion, but we're giving you kind of a loose set of things to kind of look at. Uh, the point schedules on pages 8, 9, and eight, nine, 10, and 11 are what you use to kind of look at those points. I know that sounds like a lot of rubrics and stuff of that nature, but uh, it kind of gives you a sense of what, what we're looking for. We're looking at how people use their arguments, how they respond and refute those arguments how they use their information or evidence, and how well do they structure it and present it, okay? And the more they do that, the better off they are in terms of being able to, um, you know, get higher and higher speaker points. So we kind of set out some things, but you can, uh, I think also another page on that page 11, you'll see that there's some acronyms that we use a lot. Um, you know, we talk about an argument having three parts, uh, having a claim or an assertion. Uh, you know, if I say that, I like to eat, just in case y'all didn't know. I just want to, so, so if I talk about food, that's all right with y'all this morning? Okay, okay. I'm just, just want to make sure, because some of y'all look like y'all can get on my, I mean, yes, y'all need to work, get, yes. You, work, you got to work and get like this. I just want to put that out there. Now, the thing I want to say is that, let's say I say to you, how many people like, uh, give me something y'all like to eat? Chicken. Chicken. What? Crab cakes. Crab cakes. How many, we got chicken and crab cakes here. Anybody, how many people like chicken? Okay. How many people like crab cakes? Mm, somebody here went up high. So we're going to crab cakes. Okay. So, so why is it that you like crab cakes? Oh, you don't like, you like chicken. chicken. Yeah, chicken. yeah, why do you like crab cakes? Oh, I love seafood. I love to be able to try it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's so what is it? Right, okay. Right. They're delicious. They're delicious. They're light. Oh, she closed her eyes too. Did y'all see how she explained it? She couldn't even open her eyes when she was explaining it. It was so good. She was reminiscing going back in her mental roller disc. Like, it's light. It's flavor. I mean, she was like an episode of food on the Food Channel or something. Like, we were just like, she was going there in that space. Now, they gave, they both had the same assertion, which was crab cakes are good. Okay? But do we have the same reason? No. No. So, one, the second component of an argument is your reason. Okay? So, in this case, we had different reasons. Now, the third part of an argument, which we were talking about on page 11 at A-R-E, the third part of an argument is evidence, okay? So, when you're looking at, maybe that's one way you help evaluate the debate. Look at who gave better arguments. Like, who not only just gave assertions, who not only gave reasons, but who also had evidence to support their assertion and reason. So, in this discussion, we have different reasons. So, we could have a debate over crab cakes. Why are crab cakes the best? You got this because. And we got it because it's so light. It's so fluffy. It's just so. I didn't put much thought into it, but. Well, that's all right. We ain't holding it against you. We, we still love you. We still love you. But the point I'm trying to get at is that even though the, the students will have different reasons in the course of the debate for why we should or should not do, do transportation infrastructure, why it will or will not hurt the economy. And so you are there to kind of evaluate that reasoning and see who uses the evidence to support their reasoning and assertions. Okay? And then you got things like. Uh, Mr. T, just breaking that down real quick for you. That's three components to look at and evaluate the facts. Both sides are going to say you should vote for us. But how do you decide who you vote for? Maybe you look at three things, and these are three things you use in your life. So I'm giving y'all some, some good stuff that y'all can use. This with y'all, 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 boo, y'all significant other, y'all love, or y'all like. Y'all can take these skills and y'all can like, and then when they be like, you just so right, and you be like, yes, I know, I know. Okay? <laughs> And so you can use Mr. T. Mr. T just says that three things, three ways to evaluate impacts, okay? Or if, you know, and that is magnitude, how big is it, okay? The risk, when will it happen? How the likelihood of it happening? And T is time frame, when will it happen? So you can maybe have, you know, listen to the students, you can be like, well, which one of these things are going to happen first? Which one is bigger? Which one is more likely to happen? 
and maybe you use that as a way to evaluate who you think won the debate. So we gave you these as just kind of like loose models to be able to use in order to help evaluate the debate rounds. Uh, but they're here at your, at your discretion. Okay. So I think I have given and explained everything. Look how beautiful that time is. Brown started at 10. We got coaches meeting going to start here in a second. This is beautiful.